Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. All right, everybody, it's 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Um, we're going to operate slightly different today because we're going to stop in the middle and have some questions, and then we'll have questions at the end. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat box. I am Thomas Bowles, the Ag Agent here in Prince William County, and I'm happy to have Kathy Jens, who is an editor with Washington Gardener Magazine, um, to present today on roses. So with that, Kathy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. And for those who are watching the recording, welcome. So as Thomas said, we're going to stop about halfway through to catch up on some questions at that point. And then we'll take questions again at the end, of course. And we have a ton to go over. So I'm going to talk fairly fast because roses are such a big topic. Uh, but basically, we're going to go over rose growing sustainably in, and organically uh, in Virginia and the surrounding areas in the Mid-Atlantic. And um, we're going to start off with some eye candy to get you excited about growing roses, some beautiful varieties of roses that do well here. And then we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty probably questions that you have about fertilizing and care. And then we're going to talk after the Q&A middle break about pruning. So we'll see how much time we have left for pruning, but that's such a big topic that could almost be a whole separate session. So let's jump in and get started. All right. So first thing we want to do when we're selecting roses for our gardens in Virginia and the surrounding areas is to pick disease resistant varieties. Now I want you to key in on that word resistant. So it is not disease proof varieties. So still might be hit with a little black spot, still might get a little mold, a little bit of dropping of leaves, but they're tough plants in general. So roses exist for centuries without human care in abandoned cemeteries, at old homesteads. Um, so just know that most roses will still do well for you. They might even give you some flowers and stuff without any care at all. But of course, the more care you give, give them, the better they perform. So some general uh, disease resistant varieties that I uh, have trialed myself and have friends who have trialed in their gardens and in area public gardens that do well are, number one, if you're looking for that old-fashioned English highly scented rose, then you want to look at the David Austin Roses collection. Um, so they trial a lot of their roses in Texas um, in really harsh conditions for their U.S. marketed roses. So check out some of those in their catalog. Next is the knockout roses, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So you've got the original red knockout kind of shrub size rose. Um, and then they introduced a pink and a yellow. And they've just introduced a petite knockout, which is a con container size rose that gets to about 18 inches or so. And that one has a little bit of a scent to it. So that's one of the complaints people have had about knockout roses is they're really tough, disease resistant, low maintenance roses, but they didn't have that great rose scent to it. So the petite one has a little bit more of that and it's a little bit obviously dwarf and shorter. Um, from that same breeder as knockout are drift roses. And those are ground cover or spreading roses that stay low. Um, picture to the right here, I have the peach drift, um, which is being um, at the Smithsonian Gardens right in front of the castle. If you go to the National Mall, you can check out a nice bed of drift roses to look at those. So those are fairly low maintenance, easy care plants as well, designed for the home landscape. Then there's their competitor, Oh So Easy Roses series, and that comes from Monrovia out of California, but that is trialed all over the U.S., including in Georgia and North Carolina and, and places that have similar hot and humid summers to us, and it's doing pretty well. Next is the Brenda Bella Roses. That is a series that comes out of Australia. So Brenda Bella is a, a location name in Australia, so you'll recognize that series. And I'll show a Brenda Bella Rose in an upcoming slide. And why I really like these is because 
tough as nails. I had one in a container on my driveway all summer and winter, never went into the ground, hardly got watered, died back all the way and still came back. So <laughs> if that can survive those conditions, it can survive most any garden conditions. And then finally are earth kind roses. So this isn't a breeder series or a a marketing program for roses. This is out of Texas um, extension program, Texas A&M University, and they are trialing every kind of rose they can get a hold of, and they are trialing it for disease resistance, and it's under the Earth Kind series or website. So if you're looking up a rose, you can look up if it's an Earth Kind and it's got that registration mark with it. Um, so I'll show you a, some, a few of those coming up here. So our first is I mentioned the David Austin Rose series and I'm trialing Olivia and that's been one of my favorites and best performers. And so if you want that beautiful full kind of pin cushion look with a super fragrance, then that might be one you might check out. And this photo was actually taken at the Franciscan Monastery in DC. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of variety of where it's growing in, in and around the city and Virginia. Next is, I mentioned the Oh So Easy was the answer to knockout roses. And this is peachy cream and Oh So Easy, of course, comes in a variety of colors. And I think it's a more attractive rose than the knockout rose and a little bit more open and floriferous. So if you're looking for a low maintenance landscape rose, maybe check out the Oso oh Easy series in addition to the knockouts. Um, next is an old, old fashioned rose. And this is New Dawn Climbing Rose. This is in the Earth Kind approved series. So if you're looking for an heirloom rose that has a nice rose scent and is a climber, New Dawn is one of those that many rosarians swear by, that that's like the backbone of their garden, of their climbing roses. And here I have a little close-up of the flower. It's a little bit smaller, maybe like um, silver dollar-sized rose than some of the big um, floribundas. And then here it is trained up columns and uh, this is at an estate in Virginia. All right, so our next Earth Kind rose. So this has been trialed by Earth Kind Roses and given their stamp of approval. And I've also trialed it um, in my garden and many rosarians I know have this one. And this is the Mutabilis China Rose. Um, it was discovered in the 19th century, about the 1850s brought over to the United States. And it's a large shrub rose um, good background plant can get up, up to about eight feet high and wide. And what's amazing about the metabolist, sometimes people will also call it the butterfly rose, is it has these single petal flowers that open up and they start with a tight, if I can see a bud on there, like a tight orange bud, open up peachy colors, transition to pink. So these are all the same and that's the metabolist mutation. Uh, is you've got this whole rose bush covered in different color blooms from shades of peachy pink to pink to dark pink and then they self-shed and it is extremely disease resistant and for old-fashioned rose you'll notice the foliage is a little bit smaller and tighter than some of our modern roses Right, next, another old-fashioned one that's been given the Earth Kind stamp of approval. Um, this is the Lady Banks Rose, and sometimes you'll see it in catalogs as Banksii. Um, so this is a little bit different rose in that it's not a climber and it's not a shrub, but it kind of just drapes itself over wherever you want to put it. So it could even like spread across the ground or over into another evergreen or a shrub. Here is a person draping it over a nice six foot fence. And I'll give you a close up on the left just to show you the buttery color. It comes in a paler version as well, but the foliage is more ferny if you look at it. So it's got that nice thin ferny foliage, which I think makes it a little more disease resistant to all those leaf or foliar diseases. So similar to what the China Mutabilis Rose, got a much smaller leaf surface, much airier, quality to the shrub, so it's not getting so dense and getting so much fungal problems. 
All right, our next, and I told you about the Brenda Bella series earlier. So this is an example of the full shrub in a container of purple prints. And this is uh, one I put in a bud vase by my bedside here. And I can't stop talking about the Brenda Bella roses just because the scent is exactly like a green apple. So you don't even have to put your face near it. You just walk by it and you get these wafts of green apple scent from those roses. So um, if you didn't already know, roses and apples, very close relatives. Um, so that's why they get a lot of the same diseases as well. Um, but you'll often find roses with that apple-y type scent uh, versus a more like classic rose scent too. All right, so now for the Debbie Don Downer slide. <laughs> So I enticed you with some beautiful roses and some disease resistant ones that do well in our area. But I have to give you the caveat of rose, rose, rose it's hard to say, rose rosette disease, RRD is sometimes you'll see it as, is a plant virus that is transmitted by mites and they are windborne mites. Um, so there is basically nothing you can do to stop those windborne mites from coming to your roses if they are near another infected rose. Um, so, sadly, there is no known cure. There are many, many research programs going on now in um, between rose breeders and the USDA and the US National Arboretum. There are several programs being put on now to research how they can stop rose rosette disease. Unfortunately, the only way to combat it right now is if you see any sign of it on any of your roses, take that rose out all the way not just the branch that's infected take out the entire plant bag it and put it out with landscape waste um, sorry with your um trash not your landscape waste so you don't want to like put it in your compost pile or get it combined shredded up and put back on somebody's um landscape as compost or a mulch you want it out of here double bagged and out to the landfill um, so here is a picture from University of Maryland Extension showing a little bit about what rosette, rose rosette shows up and looks like. If you start to have any growth that's kind of twisted or funky or just a bunch of thorns all of a sudden appear on a branch and a bunch of these little nodes appear um, and it was normally not a very thorny bush to begin with, that's your little clue that you might have rose rosette disease. Um, so if you have any question about getting, if it's rose rosette or it's not, take a picture and I'll show, show you in a few slides who to send that into. All right, so our first usually question about roses is how to fertilize them. You've always heard probably that roses are heavy feeders, meaning when you want to have lots of blooms, you're going to need a high nitrogen fertilizer. Um, I'm not endorsing any particular brand, but Espoma's Rose Tone is an example of a high nitrogen fertilizer specifically formulated for roses. There's many others on the market as well. Um, you can also top dress with alfalfa meal is a, a great way to add nitrogen back to your soil. And you can add soil amendments like our local bloom, which comes from WSSC. Um, it's water treatment plant waste, which is what you think it is. <laughs> and it's been treated and tested and is okay to add to ornamental garden beds. And you hear me saying ornamental, not edible garden beds. Um, similar to Melorganite that comes from Milwaukee. Um, those are great soil amendments to boost the um, nitri nitrogen and the other elements in your soil for your roses and have it available to them. And I do want to make one side note on fertilizing that this time of year, early September, if you're watching this recording later on, is the last time you want to fertilize your roses for the season. You don't want to be fertilizing after this point because then you're pushing out new growth just as the plants need to go into dormancy. So basically you want to fertilize from say early April to early September would be your time period for fertilizing. Great, so next question that usually comes up is dealing with pests. And one of the most common ones in our area of course is Japanese beetles pictured here on a friend's rose. So the easiest, most effective way is just to get out there early in the morning with a cup of soapy water, 
or it can be a mason jar or anything, hold it under the roses, knock the Japanese beetles into the soapy water, put a lid on, shake it up, dispose of them. Um, you can hand pick them if you're brave enough, wear gloves maybe. Um, but in the early morning, they're moving pretty slow. They're kind of sleepy. They haven't woken up yet. So that's a good time to grab them all. Um, other ways you can deal with pests, of course, are to spray a horticultural oil, a neem oil, or a horticultural soap on the whole shrub. If you, say, have aphid issues, um, I just do a straight spray with a hose, no additives in it. So just a straight, strong spray coming out of the hose um, knocks a lot of the pests off, especially like small aphids. And you see I have little asterisks next to the oil, neem, and soap because these are naturally derived products, but they are still chemicals. So you're still going to use the same precautions, and I'll show you in the next slide, the same precautions we use for any chemical use, whether it's a naturally derived pro product, whether it's organic, whether it's OMRI or not. And um, the other precaution, of course, is to not use any of these products until you have a proper diagnosis. Because a lot of the times, what looks like pest issues on a rose might be a disease issue and vice versa. Sometimes you'll see a rose leaf with holes shot in it and you'll think that somebody has bit all those little holes into the leaf but it's actually a foliar disease and then vice versa. Sometimes you'll see this um, stripping, veining, it really looks like the leaf has turned chlorotic um, and it will actually be aphids sucking the um, juices and the chlorophyll out of there. So. You need to have a good diagnosis, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so if you have a question about the disease or pest issue, I recommend downloading uh, the PDF from Virginia Cooperative Extension, Home, <laughs> Home, Grounds, and Animals, and Section 4 in particular will help you with some of that disease diagnosis. And um, it's free and available to anybody to go on and get that. The next way we can diagnose is by sending it in to the Master Gardener at pwc.gov.org. Um, so I'll leave that email up there for a minute. So you can send a photo. Now that we have our handy iPhones or smartphones in our pockets all the time, it's easy enough to take a nice close-up photo and maybe then a full photo of the whole shrub or rose in its situation because that can give the diagnosis clues by showing the whole plant and then a close-up of maybe the leaf or the or the flower issue. Um, or you can bring in a sample uh, to a master gardener clinic or to extension office. So you can diagnose before applying any product. We want to read the labels and follow the directions carefully and double check to make sure that this is a product for use on roses. Um, because some products are very specifically formulated, say, for edible plants, for arbor or tree use. And then, of course, again, even if it's a naturally derived product, we want to use personal protection as instructed on the label, which is usually gloves and eyewear. Maybe now that we all have our masks um, for COVID, that's not a, a bad idea to also wear a mask in, in case there's any spray back onto you as well. And on the right here is a typical uh, label for a pesticide. Some of it could be tiny, tiny print. I know it could be a pain sometimes to read all that. So get out your reading glasses and read that fine print before you apply anything because most of us home gardeners tend to overdo it. We're like, if a little bit works, a lot is going to work better. And that can actually be detrimental to the plant itself. So uh, the poison, they say, is in the dosage. So a little bit is probably all you'll need. And that saves you money, saves time, and saves from future issues. All right. So I'm going to take that midway break, Thomas, if you have any questions so far in the Q&A. So far, we don't have any questions. I, I just want to make one comment um, huh? about pesticide labels. Yeah. If you're reading through a pesticide label and you don't understand that pesticide label, look for the customer service number for the company that made it and call them and ask. Uh, the pesticide companies are very responsive. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, you don't have to go through that press one for this silliness. Um, they really want to get the 
the homeowner to use the pesticide right, and so they're very responsive. That's a great point. And then the other thing we could point out on that pesticide label is the active ingredients there and the percentages. So note those if that if you were told uh, in the diagnosis to look for something specific, you want to look at that and the percentages because those can vary widely between brands. Um, and I do want to note we're using the word pesticide very broadly to include also herbicides. Um, so same thing applies to that as well. All right, anything else in the chat, Thomas, or I'll move on. Should knockout roses be deadheaded? Good question. So our next whole session is going to be on pruning. Um, you don't need to deadhead knockout roses unless you just don't like the look and they do self shed. But at the end of the season, I tend to not deadhead any of my roses about after saying, I'm going to say like September 20th, October 1st timing is when I'll stop deadheading because I like rose hips to form for the winter time. I just like the look of the rose hips and also because they're beneficial to wildlife. Birds love them. You can even collect them uh, and use them to make rose hip jelly or anything like that as well. So unless you just don't like the look of the shedding roses, um, you can leave your knockouts alone and check that off your to-do list. Okay, we have another question. From a pest management perspective, is it better to interplant roses with other plants versus roses ED? That's a, a great question. Yeah, so I didn't include a slide I have on companion planting. Um, so there's a great recent book on companion planting um, that's based on scientific studies, and that's by Jessica Walliser. Um, and you can find that everywhere the books are sold. And that came out this past year. And she does talk about the rose companions that have proved to be useful. Um, and two of them that I interplant with um, is Calamantha and Catmint. So Calamantha is often mistaken for Nepeta, um, but those are two different plants, but you can use them both as a nice understory plant, um, ground cover under your roses, because they attract beneficial pollinators and tiny wasps and bees, and some of those can um, feed on or take care of the aphids and also pollinate the roses. Uh, the other thing that they do is they keep the splash back from heavy rains from splashing back onto the leaves of the roses. So that's one of the often common causes of foliar diseases is you'll have uh, the fungal spores in your soil and you wanna put a nice top dressing over that. So that could be like the alfalfa meal or shredded leaves or hardwood bark, um, shredded up or pine fines. And then plant over that a nice low perennial or ground cover like Nepeta or Calamantha um, could be another layer to stop so much of that splash back that wets the leaves and then um, in our heat and humidity sits there and kind of makes that perfect environment right for fungal diseases. Um, another thing I was going to say about um, companion planting is that it actually makes the rose garden look a little bit better, especially at this late summer time of year into fall, when a lot of the lower half of roses are not so attractive, right? So some of the foliage has already dropped off or thinned out. So it kind of covers up those messy skirts underneath the roses. So it's always nice at, for an ornamental as well as for a preventative for some of the foliar diseases. Okay, that looks like our last question for now. Great. All right, so we're going to dive into a deep study of pruning. All right, uh, because this is usually the most questions we get about roses is how to prune, when to prune, differences in the types of roses. So first thing we'll talk about is your timing for pruning. So you're going to do your hard pruning in late February to early March for rejuvenation. And hard pruning means taking the plant all the way back. Um, so that could be down to 12 to 18 inches for most of your shrub roses. And that's your general rule for pruning. Next, 
If you ever see anything dead, diseased, or damaged on your roses, take it out as soon as you see it. So don't have to wait till late February or early March. So a lot of people, you know, read the books and they say pruning roses in, is in late winter, early spring. But anytime you see a broken branch or it starts to blacken or um, there's some dying foliage on it, take it all the way back to the stem, all the way back to the trunk, cut it right there. So we want to get that because that's going to spread disease back into the plant. So we want to get that right away. Um, next is our just regular deadheading to remove spent blooms unless the plant has been bred to self-shed. So self-shedding roses are uh, like the drift series or the knockouts. That kind of saves that for you. Again, as the person who asked before, you can deadhead those. There's no reason uh, health-wise that you can't for the plant. It's just one thing that you don't have to do because they self-shed. Um, but other ones, like I showed you um, the Brenda Bella Rose series or the David Austin roses, those you'll want to deadhead. And we'll talk about deadheading a little bit in the next slide coming up. And then if you are cutting roses for your floral arrangements, so any time of year that you have something in bloom and you want to take some of those roses and enjoy them inside, um, I recommend taking it down to the first set of five leaves. So a lot of us will go down the stem and we'll, there'll be a set of three leaves, a set of three leaves, and then the set of five leaves, take it back right to there. Um, and then you'll have nice new growth emerging back again. If you keep cutting it at the tips, it doesn't tend to send the hormones back down into the plant to tell them to send out new branching. Um, so that's why you want to take it back to that first five leaflet. Next are our pruning precautions. So just like chemical use precautions, we have our pruning precautions, especially for roses because many of them are thorny, of course. So we want to wear long sleeve shirts, long pants if you can. Uh, wear leather gloves, and of course they have specialty rose gauntlet gloves that go all the way back, but if you don't have those, at least tuck your sleeve around your glove. Sometimes I'll rubber band it so I don't get an errant um, rose branch stuck into my sleeve and then catches me there. Um, wear goggles or eye protection and use sharp and clean tools. So dull tools, just like dull knives in, in cooking, um, can be dangerous. So we'll talk about sharpening your own tools in a couple of slides, but there are professional sharpening services available. So you might want to have that done uh, once a year or so, maybe right before that hard pruning in late winter. Um, so you could go to your local hardware store or garden center. Sometimes sharpening um, trucks will set up at a local farmer's market or at a gardening event. So look out for those to get professional sharpening done. And we'll talk really quickly about some of our tools that we use for pruning. So for roses, uh, most of the work you're going to do is with the hand pruners that are shown here in the slide. So a nice pair of hand pruners that are really fitting to your hand. And that's why they have all these different ones here, uh, because they're different weights and they're ergonomically different. Um, you should, when you go to a garden center or a hardware store, pick up those hand pruners and try them out for the weight of your hand. Because a lot of us have different hand strengths, of course, um, and that there can be a huge wide range. And you'll be amazed when you find that hand pruner that works for you, that you can go on and do for an hour or so. If it's a, not a good hand pruner for your size hand or fit, you might last maybe 10 minutes before your hand is aching right from, from that. And one of the great introductions I've seen lately um, for the hand pruners are ones that are self-cranking or dialing. Sometimes you'll see ratchet, ratcheting hand pruners so that you can do a partial cut if your hand isn't that strong and then a full cut. Um, and it'll hold that branch or cut in there for you. So uh, next note I had here was your bypass is your cleanest cut. So that's your scissor type cut um, versus anvil, which is a flat blade hit by another blade. So that's that. So anvil roses used to be recommended for just rose pruning specifically because of those hard canes in winter. And you could still use the anvil one, but I find the bypass to still be the cleanest cut 
And that's again the scissor type where they pass each other rather than hit on top of another blade. Um, so your next is pruning shears um, and that can be for uh, a type of rose like the Lady Banks that I showed you earlier. Could be a, a prune back um, mid-season when it starts to get um, just a little shaggy looking, but normally we're not using pruning shears too much on roses. Next uh, step is our loppers, and that's the one I use the second most in my garden is a nice pair of long loppers, about um, three feet long handle. There's telescoping loppers now, so you can really get into the, the middle of the rose bushes, and those are for anything that's over about a quarter inch, quarter and a half diameter, so your thicker stems. And the bypass pruners, I should have noted, that's for anything smaller than maybe a half inch. Um, but most of them will have the ratings for how thick, how thick you should go there. <laughs> and take it from me, I've broken a few hand pruners trying to cut things that I should have cut with loppers because I was too lazy to go back and get the loppers <laughs> for it. So rather than break your expensive hand pruners, use them for just the thickness that they are prescribed for. And then finally, a good handsaw. So they have handsaws that have folded in blades that you fold out, um, and that's for cutting off whole branches or anything thicker, like two inches or, uh, or above. All right, so tool maintenance. I talked earlier about getting a professional um, sharpening maybe once a year or so. You can buy your own sharpener and do sharpening between roses. So if you did, did say a whole set, um, a shrub border, and then we're moving on to another bed, uh, you can sharpen between that to give your just a couple wipes to give yourself a fresh sharpening. Um, I also recommend a little bit of like a WD-40 type oil or lubricant on the hinges here because it can get pretty rusty on your pruners. And then for sanitation, now this is kind of, a lot of us neglect this between roses. So at least carry with yourself the, a bleach handy wipe or a swab with rubbing alcohol on it and give your pruner blades a good wipe between each shrub or different rose plant. Now, technically you should be wiping the blade between every cut. So I'll go from one branch to another branch, another branch, but I'm realistically gonna say, who's gonna do that? Like, <laughs> we're too busy cutting, 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 but I would say once you did one shrub or one climbing rose and we're done with that one, so you do not spread any disease from that plant to another plant, then give your blades a good wipe between that. Um, you can even um, soak it very briefly in a 10% bleach solution as well, like dip it in, dip it out, wipe the blade clean type of thing. But again, um, at least do it between moving from one plant to another so you're not carrying disease. And that includes, say you pruned a Wygela or a Hydrangea and then moved on to a rose because there are some cross um, problems that you can have. And especially when you're going from fruit trees and we talked about apples, being related to roses, if you're going from any rose relatives like quince or roses, uh, I mean, roses or apples or crab apples and going to a rose, then you really want to have good sanitation on your tools. All right, so we talked about our pruning and that's a good shot of one of my loppers there, one of my interns using the loppers up uh, to trim a small tree branch. Um, so we talked about dead, diseased, or damaged. If you see any water spots, suckers, or rubbing in your um, rose bushes, you can take those out at any time. So we'll talk about what comes up from beneath the soil um, and the grafting node in a little bit. And all of that should be taken down to the ground. If two branches are crossing and rubbing and causing damage, that's where insects and other disease issues can enter. So you want to make a choice and take back maybe this branch all the way back to the stem. Um, so we're going to also move any bad branching. So if there's two sets of V's that are crossing like this, we want to make a decision between those two. And um, in the winter time, we can do a quick pruning going into winter. If, like say on our climbing rows, you have a whip that's just out there swaying back and forth in the wind, hitting things, hitting you in the pathways, 
cut that back so it's not rubbing and hitting against other things and that's going into the winter time. Um, our other reason for pruning is to maintain, of course, size and shape, especially for hedges and foundation plantings, uh, allowing light in and circulation, I should add there, because that's the number one reason why we're pruning roses at the end of winter is to increase that light in the middle and air circulation uh, to prevent a lot of the foliar and uh, disease issues um, and thinning out to reduce disease and increase vigor. So that's a funny one, right? We're pruning to increase vigor. So what does that mean? So that means wherever we cut a plant, but especially a rose, uh, it's indicating to the plant that it's been damaged there, right? That maybe an animal came along, a prehistoric dinosaur or whatever, and chomped that plant down, and it's going to send out new growth to that point. So wherever you are telling it, that you're cutting it, you are actually telling it to send out new growth to there. So that's a, a little bit different philosophy in American gardeners and pruners than in Europe. In Europe, they prune to, to um, guide and send the growth. And in America, we prune to hold back growth. So we have to kind of get our heads around the fact that wherever we're cutting, we're indicating to the plant, this is where you should start growing again. And we'll talk about that in a few slides, and I'll have some close-ups telling you how to, how to guide that growth. Um, so again, stimulating growth, flowering, and fruit production, especially in fruit trees, um, removing spent flowers to increase and lengthen flower production, and clearance for passersby. So again, if anything is impeding a pathway or a sidewalk or constantly hitting you, take that back at any time. All right, so proper cutting. We'll talk about this really quickly, that the branch collar or branch bark ridge is what you wanna cut back a whole branch to. So say I saw disease on one particular, and I'm gonna use a pen probably for this, if you can see it in the camera. This is my stem, this is my branch, and it's getting black at the tip. It's getting some type of canker disease. I'm gonna cut it all the way back into the branch collar and the branch collar is a little bump right where the branch meets the um, stem right there so like where our knuck think of it as the knuckles of the tree and you're going to do it at an angle but flush to that so i'm not going to leave a stub right like this i'm not going to leave this little stub out here i'm going to take it all the way back to like here um, hope that makes sense so we're also going to take, when we're reducing the size of the overall shrub, we're going to take it back to an outward facing node. And I'm going to show you a slide with a close-up of an outward facing node in a little bit so you can know what that is. But that's the growth points or tips along the branches. And you want the outward facing ones to send the growth outward instead of inward into the shrub where it can cause crowding and overlapping of stems. Um, so again, I, I just talked about not leaving a, st a stub or cutting it flush. So if I was to cut this pencil back or this pen and leave it like here instead of here, I'm letting it have introducing insect and disease issues where if I cut it all the way back to the branch collar, it'll heal over itself. It'll form a scab. Um, and that's why we don't wanna leave a bunch of little stubs hanging out all over. Um, so when you're hand pruning or using the lopper, you want to make the cut as deep down and as a cutting blade as possible. So meaning you're not cutting at the tip uh, with the pruner, you're cutting back here. Um, and that's a mistake a lot of us pruners do when we're around our garden. We tend to do like tip, tip, tip. And that might be okay for deadheading and just taking off spent blossoms is just a little with the tip cuts. But when you wanna cut off a whole branch or something, you wanna get all the way back into the blade um, to make the best cuts possible. And then of course we wanna choose the best tool for the size of the branch. And we also wanna stay above the graft. So let's talk about the graft and suckers for a second. So many roses that you purchase are grafted onto a hardy rootstock. Um, so what does that mean? So you probably have uh, a bare root rose or you purchased a rose in a container and when you pull back the soil, you wanna see if that rose is on a grafted rootstock 
and it usually have looks like a knot around the base and then the roses uh, roots coming off the bottom and then the rose is grafted there and coming out to that top or is it on its own roots and a lot of times when you purchase a rose in a catalog or at a store you need to look at the tag and it will say bare root or own root roses um, it won't necessarily say if it's grafted you'll need to look for the graft along the stem and it'll usually look like a fat kind of knotting around the base of the stem Anything that comes out below that graft, you need to prune out because below that graft is that other hardy rose stock that it's been grafted onto. So you have this beautiful cultivar of a rose, a cut rose that you want to grow, a uh, Floribunda show rose or something, and it's grafted onto this old hardy, could be a Mr. Lincoln or another rose, and then this rose starts to send out from the roots a sucker and comes up and then it sends another sucker and comes up and then in a year or two if you're not pruning well the other rows will dominate and take over and soon that beautiful big white piece rose that you bought is this dark burgundy kind of um, unscented shaggy looking rose <laughs> so that's why after a few years you might have a totally different rose than the rose you bought and that's what happened so check around the base of your roses every few months or so and of course when you're doing that um, hard pruning in late winter and make sure nothing is growing from below that graft point if it's a grafted rose all right so um, i told you i would show you where the outward facing growth growing node node is so we're doing a pruning in and late winter early spring and this little red, cherry red thing, here's the thorns, here's the stem, nice good growth. We're going to cut to right above that. So about a centimeter to a half inch is fine. You don't have to get it like right on that edge, just a little bit above that growth node. And this is the middle of the shrub here. And so I want to do the next outward facing one, which is that one there. So if there's an inward facing one, you can barely barely see it sorry for the photo you guys in the shadow right here is an inward facing one if i were to cut this rose back to here to this inward facing one then the next growth that it would send out would be from this node into the interior there um, so i'm cutting it back to here so it will start to grow this direction all right so i just wanted to show you a quick photo so you can recognize what rose canker disease looks like this is a disease of winter time, and this is an opportunistic disease that happens in our cold uh, winter time because we have a freeze thaws, freeze thaw, freeze thaw cycle. So it expands and cracks the wood and enters into the woody branches of the roses. So if you start to see this, especially with that red halo around it, you want to take this entire branch back and below that canker. So if there's an outward facing node, there's an inward facing node here. I'm going to look for the next outward facing node and take it back to there. All right. So um, pruning is a, a difficult one to, to learn just from me describing it to you today. So I do have some really quick one to two minute videos on YouTube at Washington Gardener Magazine that you can watch um, on how to prune rows safely. Finding the bud union, that graft I talked about, how you can recognize it and see it, um, and how and where to make your cuts, and also pruning a container rose. So I think it helps a lot to watch somebody prune and to go out in the garden and prune with somebody else for your first couple of times. And then once you do it and you recognize those outward facing nodes and the graft union and the suckers coming out the bottom, then you're good to go on your own. So it can be a tough one to do first by yourself on your first time. So that's why I recommend going out with like your local Rose Society. So I'm a member of the Potomac Rose Society. And here we are, a bunch of us members um, in March a couple years ago at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland, um, cutting back all of their roses for them. And this was a great way to get a good lesson is to volunteer um, at a local public garden and help them prune their roses and do it alongside some of these veteran rosarians who really know their stuff and can really teach you how to do it. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned from some of these veteran rosarians is 
do more than you think. So if you have a full shrub rose that has eight or 10 beautiful uh, branches that created wonderful flowers this year, you're gonna take back almost all of them and leave about three to four of them. So if I had eight or 10, I'm cutting back at least six of them. And those three to four, I'm taking them to, down to about 18 inches above the graft union or bud union um, or the ground if it's an own, own root rose. So, you know, your first few times of pruning, you're going to be like, I'm taking back all of that good growth. That's sacrificing a lot of the plant. And you're taking out, I would say, two-thirds or more on roses, which a lot of times in pruning, we're told not to take more than a third of a plant back every season. That's not the case for roses. We're going to take out uh, the majority up to 75% of a rose's growth from the previous season to rejuvenate for next year's growth. All right. So, and this is what I was going to show, a small rose garden and what proper pruning can do. So you'll see this is the first flush of blooms in late April, early May, and they've taken it and they've got all their outward facing nodes. They've got beautiful openness here around the base and look at that just down to three and then beautiful specimen roses here. All right, so let's see how I am for time. Yeah, we got plenty of time for some good questions. I did want to let you know, um, you can contact me through my social media. I'm at WDC Gardener on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. Uh, our blog and website is washingtongardener.blogspot.com. I'm Facebook at Washington Gardener Magazine, and we have a podcast called Garden DC. And I welcome your questions at any time after this talk. If you're like, hmm, I forgot to ask this, or I have a whole different question uh, about another topic, you can get me through any of that social media um, and catch me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, and I'm totally open to that. And if you like this talk today, I'd love your review on greatgardenspeakers.com. And I'm going to put the slide back to my um, contact information in case you guys want to jot that down. And now, Thomas, I'm imagining in our last 10 minutes or so that there's some more questions. Um, I'm not seeing any in the chat box, but um, we have such a small group. If anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, that would be great. And I was going to say, if we have a little extra time, um, I can share some local public rose gardens that you can visit for great examples of some roses grown, some of them chemical free, or at least artificial chemical free. Do you have any tips for uh, transplanting roses? Ah, that's a good one. So transplanting roses. So there's an old saying, and I kind of believe this one, that you should never plant a new rose where an old rose died. So that's kind of disappointing, right, <laughs> in our landscape plans if that's where we want the rose. So I would say if you want to plant a new rose where an old rose died, and that's usually because you think that there might be some type of disease or something left over in the soil that could affect the new rose and you lose that one again, um, is to take out a, a big circle of that soil and amend it well um, if you're doing that. So most bare root roses you're going to get, um, so you have your your bud union, you have your little stick above probably, and then a nice spray of roots. So you're paying for the roots, uh, those hardy rootstock and that one grafted um, stem above. So you want to take care of that one grafted stem above. When it arrives, if it's by mail order or you bought it in a box in a store and it came bare root, you want to soak it in a bucket of water. Um, for at least, I would say, four to six hours. Sometimes I'll let it go overnight, soak it, because they've really been um, through the ringer by the time they got to you or came through the store to you. Um, so give those roots a good soaking. Meanwhile, while they're soaking, you can plant, uh, you can dig your hole. Um, so you want to dig down about two or three feet. You want to give the roots plenty of room. And you want the bud union, or that graft, as, as I'm also calling it, to be right above the surface of the soil so that you can see it. 
and then you can mulch around it so you don't have to see the ugly bud union but you want to have it in Virginia in our area right above the soil if you are a northern gardener say New York State Minnesota then you are going to bury that bud union why we're not burying it in the south or or glow here is because that tends to make more suckering and then you won't know which is your original rose and which is the suckering roots um, but we have mild enough winters that it can sit right at the soil level or right above it and you're going to fill the hole with uh, amended soil so i use about a third uh, organic compost added back into the native soil because I want the rose to get used to being planted in the native soil. I don't want to give it all new beautiful potting soil or potting mix or peat mix in that hole because what happens is it just sits in that hole and never expands its roots into the neighboring soil because why would you? You're in a warm beautiful bathtub right you don't want to get out of that bathtub into the cold air. <laughs> Same thing with the rose's roots. It's going to stick in that nice, beautiful soil and never move out into the native soil. So give that a good mix with um, some of the soil amendments that are available to you. And then you're going to kind of create a cone or a volcano inside the hole, um, about a foot or a foot and a half high. So it'll just look like a mound of soil inside the hole. And you take your bare root rose and you put it over that volcano, that mound of soil, and spread the roots like that. So you got to spread the roots out so they're not all tangled up and give them a good nice start and then slowly backfill in the soil. Tamp it, but don't push out all the oxygen. Just tamp it a little bit. So you don't want to just go around and hit it with your foot and stamp it in because you're pushing out all those good oxygen molecules that the you need in between the soil for good drainage and movement and for the roots to breathe because um, roots do need oxygen too and then you'll water it in well and then keep an eye on it um, for watering usually about an inch of water a week if we don't have a good steady rain then you're going to need to to water it in well and that's a good point in general about watering roses is that uh, a lot of times why they stop blooming for many of us is because around July or August, it's kind of a drought time for us in Virginia and the surrounding area. So if they're not getting regular watering, they slow down. They conserve and they put their, keep their water at their roots and they're not flowering as much. So if you want it to keep flowering throughout the summer, you're going to have to have a consistent watering program and another side note on watering um, is to always water the root zone and not the foliage so you're not going to take a hose out and just spray down you're not going to use a, a, a sprinkler system you can use a little emitter system at the root zone or you can hand water around the base of the plant which is what I do that was a long question <laughs> a long answer to a short question. So we have a, another question. Um, you showed a picture of a rose with three main trunks. What's the ideal number? I missed the, what type of trunks? Three main trunks. Um, and so the second part of the question is, so when we trim back two thirds of the branches, are these branches off those main trunks? Yep. So we're going to, I'm going to, use these live ones where they're full and bloom to show so you'll see that there's branching off this back one here and branching here and branching here so we're going to take maybe this whole inner part back here and then cut to an outward facing node here so we'll have this as one that we leave and then the center one we're probably going to cut back to an outward facing node about there and then in this outward one here, I think there's a fourth one to the back. We might take that one all the way back down. Um, then we'll cut to about an outward facing node there, if that makes sense. Um, so a lot of times in rose pruning, there you come to a point where you're like, this or that, this or that, which one should I keep? They're both equally strong. I like both of these right here but which one is going to do a little bit better for the shape of the plant, a little bit further out, a little bit more open. 
sometimes it's 50 50 and you just have to toss a coin and make a choice um so that that's the kind of the art of the pruning part um and as i said if you do your first pruning sessions with an experienced uh, rosarian then you can kind of get an idea for that's um that's my little time alarm there idea for how they make their choices and their decisions so um, you can also start going around and, as I said, look at some of the local public gardens and watch how they're pruning as well um, to see some of the choices they make. And again, it, every individual is different. So I might have chosen to keep this branch here on this one and you chose this one, um, but still probably be just as beautiful as Rose next spring. So let's see if I can scroll back to where we were cutting see if I have another slide of that. No, sorry, I don't have another close-up of that one, unfortunately. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, that looks like our, our last question. Okay. So we have just a couple minutes left. So I was going to recommend um, the Bon Air Memorial Rose Garden um, near Alexandria, Arlington, Virginia, as a great one to check out and maybe see about volunteer hours at that. Um, and of course, there are many great books on rose pruning in particular and rose care. Um, and I was going to also note in some of the rose uh, deer disease resistant ones that I had recommended um, that there are always new roses coming on the market, always <laughs> tons more. So if it's not familiar to you, you can again check that EarthKind website to see if they've ranked it or not, and or you can ask a local rosarian. Um, the other thing I was going to say that I forgot to say before is that many ro local rose societies, like the Potomac Rose Society, offer free consultations by a local rosarian. So if you are really stumped by something, if you have like a climbing rose that you inherited with your house, you don't know what variety it is. It's just gone crazy. You don't know how to handle it. You can ask for a rosarian to come out. Um, so you would go to their website and usually they have a place to make an appointment. Of course, during COVID times, you know, making appointments with a rosarian might be a little tricky, might have to wait till the next growing season, but um, that's a great resource to have locally is a, a professional rosarian come out and talk to you. Great advice. Thank you very much, Kathy. We really appreciate you talking to us this this morning. Um, and we hope to have you back sometime soon. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And happy rose growing. I would say, you know, rose is known as the most beautiful flower on the planet for a good reason. And, you know, even if you're gardening all organically, all native plants, there's a place for at least one rose in your garden. Well, we'll see you all next time. And it will be sending the link with the video and an evaluation out um, probably at the end of the week or beginning of next week. So have a good day, everybody, and we'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. We can be reached at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.